we start Amit and Rishi. Yes, yeah. Waiting for signal from Rishi. Should we start? Yes, go for it. Yes. Rishi. Yep, let's get going. Good afternoon, everyone. Very warm welcome on a very warm day <laughs> to our first session of a brand new class, which is uh, building innovative AI applications with ChatGPT. Uh, we had over 100 signups by students and parents, and we are sure you will learn lots of new things over the next few weeks. My name is Manoj Goyal. I'm one of the coaches assisting my dear friend, Dr. Amit Gupta, who is, you can see him with AI Club logo, is the founder and head of products for AI Club. And the curriculum that you will see in the next few weeks has been tested and delivered to high school kids in Bay Area for several years. And many of his students have won prizes and awards on the applications and projects that they built. So what you're getting is a very proven vetted program that high school kids can understand, follow, and love. So please make the best use of this class by attending all the sessions. We will not be recording any sessions, so you cannot go back and watch the recordings and doing the projects on a timely basis. Today's class is by Zoom, but we will try to make it in person from next week. Uh, the class is brought to you under the umbrella of Saratoga Hindu Temple and Community Center, which is a nonprofit organization that has been delivering many, many classes for last 10 years for yoga and Hindi and robotics and entrepreneurship. Um, it's spearheaded by our Saratoga ex-city councilman, Rishi Kumar. Rishi is my ex-colleague from Cisco days. He's a high-tech exec, spent many, many years in IBM and Cisco, and he has two passions. One is uh, um, community service, and second is STEM education. For community service, Rishi served on Saratoga City Council for two terms, and he got several programs that have been benefiting our Saratoga community. Uh, three years ago, he had a chance to serve on the panel at the California Department of Education, where he pushed and pushed and pushed to get computer science as a course available in every high school in the state. And that work of his from three years ago is taking fruit uh, this year, or and last year, I believe, 2022. I'll let him tell more details. So it's being now offered in every high school as elements of computer science. And Rishi is now running for Congress. So once he makes it to Congress, he will bring this high-tech rigor and STEM education for the whole country. So with that, Rishi, uh, turning over to you, please tell us what this class is and what your thoughts are, why you introduced this class this year, and then you can introduce Amit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manoj, uh, for the very kind introduction. Uh, we had over 100 RSVPs. We still see 35 only uh, who have joined. I hope uh, some of the others will also uh, be joining us. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very good class. And uh, I really appreciate uh, Amit and Manoj uh, driving it for us. And just a quick clarification of what Manoj said, uh, the K-12 computer science curriculum that we actually rolled out for the state of California is for a, every public school child in California. So if your child is uh, in a public school program, chances are they're benefiting from that. And we spent, I would say, almost a year and a half working on that curriculum. And I'm quite proud of that effort. Uh, that was a California Department of Education. Rishi, uh, can you turn on your video? We can add you to the main screen. Uh, yes, it, it, it's it's fine. Uh, you know, I was uh, sort of, I'm, I'm actually outside, so it may not be very conducive. So, so, so essentially, you know, this program and all the other STEM programs that we have run has it's been very exciting for me. And this one today 
is probably one of the most exciting class in the last 11 years that we have offered. As uh, Manoj mentioned, I feel very blessed in uh, offering such amazing opportunities. Our entrepreneurship bootcamp, for example, it went viral and we ran it in 13 cities, 12 in California, and then Charlotte, North Carolina. We had Mayor Sam Licardo from the city of San Jose who sponsored the learning. And we taught so many underprivileged uh, students of San Jose. Altogether, we trained over 2,000 students in the art of entrepreneurship. And uh, if a few of them just pick STEM as a college or career option, I would feel very good about my karma and about my zeal for, for community service. Uh, I, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, artificial intelligence and how it's going to change the world. And that is the reason why this class is very exciting. And uh, this is probably the reason why many of you are here. As you can see, a shift happening. And uh, I can see that too. So when you look at the OpenAI platforms that have been churned out, I use these platforms daily and they are creating incredible efficiencies for me. And if you're not using them daily, uh, whether you're a parent or a child, I highly recommend you start using them. Uh, so I use different platforms. Uh, I started with ChatGPT, uh, then I use Bard, I use Bing, then I use the new uh, one that was rolled out last week, the Claude uh, or Claude A, and uh, I'm discovering their strengths and weaknesses. And the IBM, the company I used to work for, experimented with Watson back in 2012, long time back, and is now jumping back with uh, rolling out an AI platform for the enterprise. So there's a lot of jostling for space and the battle's on for first part, but there is an opportunity for everyone to grab a specific turf and be the best there. And you will see that play out over the next uh, decade or so. I think we are in the very early stages. But speaking of battle, let's talk about a tech leader and uh, someone who has taken the world by storm uh, on social media and everything else. And that's uh, our good friend, Elon Musk, <laughs> who once said that, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. He says it's we are calling out the demon when we are when we are building AI. But he actually invested billions in generative AI and ChatGPT open source, and he expressed a bit of frustration in ChatGPT becoming a for profit company. But that's a different story. He actually uh, he called himself a complete idiot for leaving open AI. But lately, what he has done is. He's jumped onto the bandwagon and started his own AI company, XAI. If you haven't seen that in the news, but uh, that was uh, uh, that came up on the radar just a couple of days back. So, so which brings me, you know, there is a dichotomy in Elon Musk's head, but there is a dichotomy that currently exists with uh, AI. So you cannot have your cake and eat it too. And we have to make a choice. So we have to sort of figure out, is AI evil or is it good? On one hand, we see uh, the billionaire Mark Anderson, our Netscape uh, guy who wants unhindered AI development. And to an extent, I agree, the country has that has the best AI engine will likely be the front runner to harness the benefits. And uh, now when you see the emergence of groundbreaking AI technologies, uh, on one hand, these advancements have potentials, enormous potentials, for example, in accelerating scientific discoveries and automating routine tasks. But in the wrong hands, AI could also enable the manipulation of people at scale, the proliferation of misinformation and amplification of biases. And as we build incredible innovations with AI, it's critical that we remain vigilant about their ethical impl implications because there are lots of implications and we have to be a little careful. So companies developing these technologies and each of us, because when we are putting our minds into it, we have to be cognizant that we have a little responsibility to implement safeguards that will promote transparency, accountability, oversight, and all that good stuff. And, and simultaneously, it also behooves our government to update policies and regulations. In fact, I've written a policy paper guardrails for open AI and AI and the evolution of AI in America. So with diligence, co wisdom, cooperation, we can definitely harness the power of AI to create a better future while mitigating risks. And the path forward requires cultivating both awe at AI's potential, but also awareness of its perils. And so I'll leave you with uh, a couple of thoughts 
Uh, and uh, I, I, I would really recommend that we keep this, even though we are sort of, we'll be building some very exciting application, we'll get immersed in the technology, but it's also important to keep these in mind. And that's the reason why I'm bringing this up at the very first class. So for example, do you, do, you, do you need a kill switch for the AI engine? Will AI take over the world? These are some of the things that people are talking about. Do we need Uncle Sam to develop these guardrails? Now, typically the innovation that has happened in Silicon Valley has been left un unhindered. I mean, both uh, Manoj and, uh, and uh, Amit, they have benefited from that because they have rolled out companies, they have sold companies, and they have been living the Silicon Valley dream. But uh, would that be possible if we had put some, some, uh, some hindrance to, to innovation, right? Uh, if we wanted, if Uncle Sam wanted to sort of guide the innovation, probably the outcome may not be very fruitful. So how do we need, how do we prepare America for the future? Now I can, I can keep going, but I'm gonna stop here. We are already about 15 minutes in. And what I'll do is I will introduce our two instructors and uh, they have been coaching and mentoring many startups. So Manoj Goyal, he's a board member and uh, ex-president of uh, IIT startups and uh, over 120 startups, 50 AI startups. So he's a, he's a Silicon Valley leader who I respect, a uh, serial entrepreneur. Uh, when he first launched his career, he, he sold his very first company. And uh, so obviously living the dream. And he has worked for many companies like Apple, Cisco, HP. He's uh, got a master's from Syracuse Computer Science, IIT Roorkee, and also an MBA from Berkeley. And uh, Amit Gupta, you know, he's obviously, we have sent out their introductions multiple times to the email groups. And uh, he's uh, the head of products at AI Club. He's a serial entrepreneur. Uh, a few years back, uh, he sold his company to Cisco, that was Jasper, phenomenally successful. And uh, many, many years in large-scale distributed system design and development. He's a graduate from ID Delhi and a PhD from Berkeley. So I'm very blessed and honored that these two amazing individuals have stepped up and decided to team up with me to bring this program to each of you. And uh, so I'll, what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Amit now to get going. And Amit and, and Manoj are essentially going to run the next uh, uh, seven or eight or perhaps even more, many more classes based upon your insights. Uh, Amit has actually provided you a Google form. Each of you have received an email from me to fill that form. If you haven't done that, it should take you a minute. I highly recommend that you fill that up today if possible, because that will really help uh, Manoj and Amit channel their energies in making sure that we run a good stellar program. So with that, uh, a big round of applause. We can use Zoom to do the applause. Next week, we are going to likely book the community center, the Saratoga Community Center. And if you have any feedback you would like to offer, please reply to the email because we would really would like to revert back to a face-to-face -face, uh, program. And uh, I would love to hear from you. So with that, uh, let's turn it over to Amit uh, and get the session going. All right, well, thank you so much, Rishi, for the very, very warm welcome and the warm words. And what you do now is to share my screen and let me know when you can see this. All right, can we see my screen? So one thing I would request is everyone, if you don't have any background sounds, please unmute yourself. This is meant to be an interactive session. So whenever anything happens, I'd like to hear from you very quickly. So as long as there's no background noise, please unmute yourself. We'll work through this. So this is our first AI class at the Sardoga Temple at uh, this time. And so I want to welcome you all and just walk through why we are doing this and what our goal is. So by the on the right-hand side, you see the results from the survey. And this was the prime motivation for our setting of the survey is we wanted to get our understanding of your prior experience with AI and with Python which will be the primary technology we'll be using for building our APIs and for building up software. And so I was happy to see that basically the vast majority of the people responded. They had some good prior experience with Python and many have actually done good, reasonably well with, with AI also. So that's really, really good to know. 
And so we will not cover fundamentals of Python in this class. If you are in the 20% who is not as comfortable with Python, there are two aspects. One, you can pick up some Python along the way. Second, we will be putting together teams of people. And as long as the team has got a reasonably good mix of people that understand Python and people that don't, we'll be able to work through this. So that's kind of the survey part. And again, as, as Rishi mentioned, if you haven't filled out the survey, please do fill it out. It will help us level set our goal, our teaching here. And the primary goal for this particular set of classes is to give you a basic understanding of AI with a lot of focus on natural language processing of which chat GPT is kind of the most well-known example. And we want to basically give broad enough knowledge so that we kind of get a rough sense of how other people are using AI, both at high school level as well as professional level, but deep enough so that you can actually build at least some interesting apps yourself. In fact, it's our expectation that as part of this class set, every single one of you will work in teams, build a custom AI app. That makes sense? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So next question is what will we cover over the next seven or eight weeks? So the first thing to understand is that AI is a massive, massive field. We could not possibly even imagine covering it, even if it would take multiple years. What we'll do though, is that we'll basically make sure you have a good, broad understanding. So we'll start today, we'll cover the broad-based AI. And today, frankly, we're not going to do anything specific about NLP or natural language processing or chat GPT or anything else. All of that will come in subsequent sessions. And after today, our folks will switch to just talking about NLP, generative AI, chat GPT, and how to basically write good applications that use chat GPT APIs. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. And so there are a whole bunch of stuff that we will not cover. And this is only to be expected given that we are operating on a fairly constrained time frame. But just to give you a rough sense of the kinds of things that may be interesting to you, happy to refer to you to proper places. We can get good information about this, but that is out of scope for the current set of sessions. Okay, so that is the background. Here's the overall plan for today. So we'll cover a bunch of administrative items. Then we'll talk about the basic introduction to AML, how it has evolved over time. We'll talk about how AIs work and what are the different types of AI, at least one way of classifying them or grouping them. Then we'll watch a few video recordings of high school students, how they have used AI to build interesting projects. And then after that comes the exciting part, we will be building your own first AI today. And then we'll have some time left over for asking questions, any questions you may have. So that's the overall plan for today. So let's just go straight into administrative. So firstly, uh, we'll talk about modality. So today we're using Zoom, and as Rishi mentioned, we'll be doing classes in person starting next week. Location is to be decided, but likely it'll be at the Cerroga City Center. So we have set up a dedicated Slack channel for discussion, and this is the primary way for communicating outside the classroom. We'll put specific course related information here, but this is also the place for you to ask questions. And our target is to respond to every single question within 24 hours. And Slack invites were sent out to stu for students who filled out the survey by noon today. They also got accounts in a system called Navigator, which we're going to cover in a few minutes. Everybody else, please fill out a survey. The people who filled out the survey is in the last couple of hours. For you, we will be sending out the Slack invites by the end of the day. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. So team formation, the target to have around 10 teams total. And so we have about 40 participants. So we're looking at roughly four people per team. And what we've seen in the past is randomized groupings actually work very well. We still bring in people from different backgrounds, different experience and different points of views. And that leads to a richer project. But if the specific people that you want to work with, that's perfectly fine. We understand you have your own people, uh, your own groups. And so please just let us know. So if you can let us know within this week, if there are specific people that you want to work with for your projects, 
then we'll be able to incorporate that. Otherwise, starting next week, we'll be doing assignment for everybody else into the groups. And then, that makes uh, sense? How, will, how will they let you know? So they can let us know, frankly, by Slack. That's the yeah. preferred okay. mechanism. Yeah, OK. And otherwise, I think that's probably the best way. Thank you. Good question. OK. And the other aspect is this robotics class that immediately follows this class that starts with Hilfa. And it would be completely wrong for us to make them wait. So we will stop at 3 p.m. sharp, regardless of where we are. Any further discussion, we'll take it to Slack. Make sense? Yep. Yes. OK. So we'll be using a variety of services for what we do. And so and this is all sent out also in the survey message and the email associated with it. There's one particular service, the main service here, sorry, the GPT API, that is a paid service. And sometimes they have some credit when you sign up for an account, but regardless, this is something that you have to, be, you have to understand that this is something you'll have to pay for. And it is pay per use, so the more APIs you call, the more expensive APIs you call, the more you'll have to pay. But apart from that, the rest of the services, there's enough free quota available that you should be able to live within what's available for free. Amit, uh, will you share this particular slide on Slack? Yeah, uh, very good point, right? It's already on the Slack channel. For those who yeah, okay. already have the accounts, okay. you should see this on the Slack channel. Yeah, and that's okay. the, the, an example of the kind of information that you make available on Slack. And again, as we walk through the classes, we will walk through the specific URLs and how to access those specific services. We'll do that. Okay, any questions about what we covered so far? Okay. Can I have a show of hand, thumbs up, thumbs down, or it's clear whether there's some issues? Okay. All right, I'm seeing mostly positives. All right, good. And again, if there are any questions, feel free to, I'll start looking at chat also in a little bit. We'll walk through this. Um, chat messages. All right. Thank you. So we'll basically now switch gears and go to the next slide deck. Right. This is a very, very quick and fast introduction to machine learning. And uh, the question is a bit. Okay. So firstly, let's talk about the history of AI before we go there. Uh, can anybody guess how old is AI? How many years ago was the concept of AI first introduced? Feel free to speak. We don't need to raise oh. your hands. Sorry? 100, 40, 20, close. 30, yeah. 100. Yeah, it's actually not. That's pretty close. So the earliest reference that you find in literature, it goes back to the 1950s. So that's about 75 years ago, 70, 75 years ago. And that, that's where a lot of the scientists started discussing the basic notion of artificial intelligence. But not much happened because if you remember the computers at that time, they weren't really even proper electronic computers, the mechanical devices. Then in the 70s, computers finally became cheaper. So this kind of started making sense. The 1980s was kind of the first resurgence of AI. That's where you saw some of the original, original work happening in algorithms and neural networks. And this is where a lot of the stuff actually happened in the field. And then came a roughly 20 year period where not much happened. And the main challenge was a lot of work was happening, but there wasn't enough kind of, as it turns out, as we learn also, to use AI and to be able to properly create AI, you need to have lots of data, and you have lots of compute. And the computers back in the 80s were just not powerful enough, and there wasn't that much useful data available that could train to make good AI models. And that's kind of where we kind of got stuck between the, in the 80s and the 90s. And then starting in 2000s, because of the advent of the internet, massive amounts of data became available, and the computing finally became cheap enough that we started using AI 
and using AI for lots and lots of really, really important business reasons. Then the era of kind of large language models of which ChatGPT is an instance is, it started in 2017 with a very famous paper by people at Google. It's called, it's called Attention is All You Need. And uh, we'll briefly work through some of the concepts from the paper uh, in a few sessions later. But that's really what kicked off the modern era of ChatGPT was the paper. So you can catch this evolution, even though the core idea has been around for a long time, like 75 years, really the major, major progress happened in the last decade or two. Just interesting and also fascinating. Any questions? Uh, there are some questions on chat. Will will students get some of these slides? Yeah, so we'll make the slides available on the Stack channel. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Then very quick, this is what the overall AI workflow looks like in real life. You start by identifying a business need. Then you collect the data you need to build your models. And after you build the models, then you train them. You go through a process called training, and we'll describe that in just a little bit. Then we test the model to see how good they are, how accurate they are, and how well they work. Then we deploy them. Once you deploy the models, then they're available for business to use in the applications. Once the model is live, then we monitor it, we optimize it. And based on that, we then make additional requirements come up, and then we go through the cycle again and again. So over time, this makes the models bigger, better, and more useful for our business needs. And what we're going to do is going to cover mostly the part that starts at data and ends at connecting to business app. So this is the part that we'll cover in this particular set of classes. We'll not cover the monitoring and optimization part. That makes sense? Okay, so first, uh, I have this question. So again, I like to open it to everybody to answer. And if you want to use chat, that's fine. What does AI mean to you? What is AI? And you can also answer directly on the audio. All right, Manu says exponential learning, that's good. Other thoughts, other ideas? So we have a recursive answer, AI is AI. So yeah, so to be yeah, useful for and that's actually a very good way to think about it is AI is fundamentally about the set of technologies that make computers behave kind of like how we expect humans to behave. So, and in that sense, you can think of this different from, for example, like calculators or standard programs you use, which are more kind of deterministic and mechanical in their work. Here, AI is fundamentally about stuff that makes you think that what the program is doing is similar to what humans do when we think about stuff. So that's the artificial intelligence part. And machine learning refers to the set of technologies that are used to build programs that can basically perform in a manner that looks like AI. So that's why you can think of machine learning as a subset of AI because there may be other techniques that are possible that can make programs look intelligent. Machine learning is one set of systems, one set of programs, one set of technologies that we know how to use and how to build with that can make programs look intelligent. And the different parts of types of machine learning that will come in just a few minutes. Then the specific subset of machine learning called deep learning and chat GPT itself and all LLMs are examples of deep learning. So deep learning refers to essentially a subset of machine learning which, which works with the uh, technologies that we call neural networks. And you can think of it essentially like neurons. 
that basically take the input from one place and the neurons feed to other neurons, you basically have a complicated graph or network through which the information passes through until you get to the answer that looks smart. And deep learning essentially basically means that we have many, many layers of neurons here. And the reason this term kind of is interesting and has become useful now is that about, let's say 20 years ago or 30 years ago, the technology just wasn't there. The computers weren't fast enough and cheap enough that you could train deep learning models. Now the technology, the technology is available. Now the data sets are available that you can train and effectively use deep learning models. And in fact, pretty much in most AIs that you'll experience in the real world, a large, large number of them, the interesting one that you see, they all use deep learning. So when you think of, for example, audio recognition, that uses deep learning. When you think of speech synthesis, that uses deep learning. When you think of uh, chat GPT, when you think of uh, stable diffusion, all of these are essentially using deep learning. The deep learning is a really, really important part of the overall machine learning environment. And later today, we will be building our first model using deep learning. Make sense? Yep. Thank you. All right, so next, so we talk about, let's talk about a few different machine learning problems. So on the, starting from the left to right, so left is actually the program that we're going to build later today. So this is a program where you basically given a picture of an animal, you'll basically be able to say, hey, this looks like a cat or this looks more like a dog. And you'll be able to do that with some reasonable accuracy. It won't be 100%, but it'll be reasonable. It'll be much like you think of statistical guessing, which just gets randomly that gives you 50% between two choices. Here, what you should see something close to 80, 90%, which is not bad. So that's kind of the first example. A second example is, for example, when people study hate speech, then they look for, for example, how does hate speech spreads online? And there you basically create essentially these clusters that talk about the different types of sites and the diff and the diff and this, you kind of see this color coded as to the different parts of the network and the links between them. So this is another kind of analysis that comes from AI. A third example, is that of programs that, for example, play chess. And many of you are aware that this is a more complicated program called Go. And a few years ago, there's a program at Google called AlphaGo that became the first program to beat humans at, at Go. And that also used AI very effectively. So you can think of essentially three different kind of large kind of problems that are, you can address using AI, machine learning. So corresponding, there's at least three different sets of techniques that come into place. So let's talk about what those techniques are. And the first group is what it's, uh, what it's called supervised machine learning, where what we do is that we provide examples where we already know what the ground truth is. So if you remember the examples of cats and dogs, so the way that training works is that we give the system lots of pictures, and we say, hey, look, this picture is that of a cat. In this picture, you see a dog. In this picture, there's a cat, in this picture, there's a dog, and so on and on and on. And once you feed it lots of information, you ask it to go and essentially try to imbibe that knowledge. And so on, it has basically absorbed that knowledge. That basically sets up what's what are called model weights. And then you can give the system a picture that it has not, never seen before and say, hey, Given this picture, tell me, do you see a cat here? Do you see a dog here? So that type of machine learning where the training is done with a data set for which you already know what the reality is, or what's referred to as the ground truth, that is called supervised machine learning. In fact, the vast majority of machine learning problems you see, they all fall under the bucket of supervised. This make sense? Yes. Thank you. The second set is what's called unsupervised. So this, if you remember, the second example we gave, which was the hate speech and classification clustering. So those are uh, uh, kind of uh, types of problems where the models are set that the models themselves essentially understand and try to figure out the relationship 
between the data points that are provided. We don't explicitly say, look, this is one cluster, or this particular person belongs to the Russian disinformation network. The system just basically pulls all that information together and extracts it out of the large data set that it's given. So that's classically unsupervised machine learning. And typically what you'd see is that with unsupervised machine learning, you need much larger data sets to get to reasonable useful accuracies. Supervised on the other hand, you can usually train with far smaller data sets. But in both cases, the bigger, the more the data set, generally the more accurate your AI will be, or your machine learning algorithm will be. Now the third major category is what's called reinforcement learning, where we don't give specific examples, but we give machines rules for what's called a reward system. To say, given a particular conclusion, here is the reward. And so for example, if you think of the game of chess, if you essentially do a checkmate, that's a plus one reward. On the other hand, if your opponent checkmates you, that's a negative one on the reward system. And the idea is that the machine will basically just by playing these games again and again, they will figure out what leads to better reward versus poor rewards. And then they will adapt their own models to increase the probability of getting a positive or high reward. So that process is called reinforcement learning. That makes sense? Yep. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. All right. So any questions about what we covered so far? Yeah, um, actually I had one quick question on the unsupervised based on the examples you mentioned on uh, hate speech. So I just wanted to, I guess, try to understand if you actually uh, give an example of what hate speech is before the clusters are formed or does the AI organically identify hate speech? Like how is that classified? Very good question. So, uh, so maybe that example was a little bit, uh, I had a little bit more information than I should have had. So essentially, the you're absolutely right. The system by itself does not know what constitutes hate speech, right? What it knows here in this particular graph is how information spreads from one node to another. Okay, understood. So, let, mm -hmm. so, so let's ahead. say if you, if you took a message from Facebook and sent it over to, and from Facebook, that same thing got posted to Instagram or to Telegram then that provides a link from Facebook to Instagram and to Telegram. Okay. You can think of lots of these links. So if you think of data sets that have got millions and tens of millions of such examples. So based on that, you can then do clustering to say the information that originates at Facebook, where does it go? So that's a link that's shown here. Now, I should probably remove the word hate speech here because even though this is being used to track hate, the way this works is that you essentially a different system extracts out the hate messages. Mm -hmm. And then this system, all it's doing is it's clustering those messages to say, how did these messages propagate through the social media network? Understood. No, okay, actually that helps, that clarifies. Um, okay, thank you so much. I, I don't think you need to remove the hate speech uh, part on how it spreads online. I think that's pretty evident. I guess I just maybe misunderstood when we were taught, when you were explaining the unsupervised part. No, no, you're asking a very, very good question. Thank you. And thank you for mm -hmm. our presentation. Yeah, mm -hmm. very good question. Other questions? Okay. So I don't see anything on chat either. So let's keep moving. So now if you don't have any questions, I have some questions for you. So I like uh, you to take a stab, just speak up or put in the chat. For each of these, what type of AIs are these likely to be? Supervised, unsupervised, or reinforcement learning? And understand that in some cases, more than one answer may be correct. So first one, when you think about predicting house prices, do you think that's a supervised learning, unsupervised learning, or reinforcement? Um, I'm going to go with reinforcement, but it could be unsupervised. OK, because? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Let me think about it. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me think about if it could yeah. be unsupervised. Right. So I see a, a bunch of different uh, 
I say thank you. So I think uh, Elisa says supervise, and that happens to be the way it's mostly done. So if you think of how house pricing predictions work, you basically start off with a lot of data about the what are called comparable sales, right? Mm. To say this house sold for twenty dollars, this house sold for thirty dollars, and so on. And based on that, you may ask saying, okay, now given an unknown house or a house for which you have information about location and square footage and number of rooms, but not anything else, how would you figure that out? And so as Alyssa and Anjali said, what you say is that you say, oh, let me try to find out what are the comparables. And then there are a bunch of different algorithms that you can use to guess the house price based on the comparables. Mm -hmm. So that's a case of supervised learning would be the most likely one. Okay. The thing is, for example, figuring out the grouping of people by where they live, for example, for figuring out congressional district. By the way, this is not talking about figuring out a congressional district you're in, but figuring out if you wanted to redraw a map, what would be a good map to redraw? Yeah. So I and say so this is unsupervised, that's correct. And why? Sensor provides because fundamentally, yeah, it's about grouping individuals in the district. You're not giving it any information upfront to say this person should be in this district or so on. You just say, hey, here are the people, here are so many people, here they, here's where they live, and just try to find so that people who live close to each other get in the same congressional district, and people that are further away, they go to separate districts. So that's a case of unsupervised. Now, the third item, predicting whether a patient is likely to develop a disease in the future based on current health markers. Is this likely to be supervised, unsupervised, or reinforcement? Okay, so here I think the vast, vast majority is saying supervised, and that is the correct answer. So again, the way you typically build this AI is that you basically have a list of kind of past patients that said this patient, these health markers, developed this disease or did not develop this disease. And based on that, you then create a model that will do the prediction. So, so that's a case of supervised machine learning. Then teaching a computer how to play a game. Is this supervised, unsupervised, or reinforcement? Yeah, this is the enforcement, right? So as I am very correctly pointed out, because you give it a reward for winning and a loss for losing. And that's classically what reinforcement is all about. OK, fifth one, uh, detecting fraud in banking transactions. Is it supervised, unsupervised, or reinforcement? So this is a, an interesting one. So in theory, it can be supervised. You can basically give an example of, okay, here are fraudulent transactions, here are regular transactions, and have it figured out. In practice, most of this tends to be unsupervised. And the reason for that is that fraud can come in many, many different ways. So what you want to do is that you basically, and the vast, vast majority of transactions are good transactions, right? So what you end up doing is you end up basically saying, okay, fine, here is a pattern of what typical transactions look like. Uh, now, something he says it can be supervised or unsupervised, but it's most likely, so it's more, most of them are super, unsupervised. Okay. Next one, teaching a self-driving car to avoid accidents. Is it supervised, unsupervised, or reinforcement? I can see it's pretty much reinforcement by landslide. Yeah. So there's an example. We kind of tell it, hey, if you kill a human being, that's not good. So give it a session negative infinity for reward. So that's a very classic case where reinforcement learning comes in very heavily. All right. Thank you. I'm actually very happy to see the answers today. We all basically got the core idea behind these different types of AI. So thank you. So that's all we have. So now let's switch case a little bit and talk about some certain projects. Give me one second. Okay, so some, so this is one question that came up was that, hey, can you tell us what some other students, like especially at middle school and high school level, what they're able to do with AI? So it turns out this is something that we actually work with. So we have an annual research symposium. The presentation is mostly by high school students. There's some middle school students also. It's open to all. The, in fact, we just had it about a month ago. The keynote was by Ashish Pansal, who's a noted NLP expert. He wrote the book on NLP also an engineering leader at Google ML. So I just thought to give you at least a rough sense of the kinds of uh, research that was done 
that made it to the presentation stage at the last symposium. So, and I'll make, I'll put this on the Slack channel so you can look at it yourself. But here's one example. Let me see if I can do this. Okay. Can everybody hear the audio? Audio? Yes. Thank you. So hi everyone, my name is Naya and I'm a current high school student. Um, and today I will be sharing my project filtered with you all. So over the last decade, the usage of social media and online messaging platforms has skyrocketed. And more recently during the pandemic, all in-person communication and interaction was, as we all know, brought to a complete standstill in an effort to keep everyone safe. Social media and online messaging sites became the primary functions of communication for everyone, but teenagers especially. And popular sites consisted of Instagram, Discord, Snapchat, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, and texting, just to name a few. On a macro, micro level, due to the lack of face-to-face -face interaction, teens were sending messages without seeing the immediate impact of their words on the recipient. So messages could take on a tone and content that otherwise may have been absent in in-person communication. Additionally, with the ability to screenshot Zoom calls or Google Meet meetings, um, students began making memes that often, you know, with the intent of being fun, had a harmful effect on others. And as a result, social media left a harmful impact on teens across the globe, including feelings of insecurity, personal attacks, and diminished mental health. I'm sorry, we're actually about 10 minutes out, so I'll quickly walk through one more, if you like. Okay, uh, let's look at this one. Just to intracranial hemorrhage detection. Specifically, I wanted to see how we could improve both detection accuracy and efficiency by adding another tier to the prediction architecture, which is a novel approach. So speaking of intracranial hemorrhages, what actually are they, right? Commonly abbreviated as IH, they're essentially a brain bleed that is often categorized based on where they actually occur within the brain. So we have five major categories, epidural, interparenchymal, intraventricular, subarachnoid, and subdural. And just looking at some of the statistics on the screen, you can see both how common they are and how dangerous they actually are, right? They're extremely common in the US, even more common in Asia and Africa. And the 30-day mortality rate is extremely high. With okay, sorry, uh, we need to answer this. So any questions about what we covered so far? No. Hi. So let's switch gears now. And we come to our main show. So this is cats and dogs. So what you're going to do now is build an AI that will reasonably accurately detect in an image whether it's a cat or a dog. And this is something that frankly was incredibly hard to do just 15 years ago, around the time when a lot of the students in this class were born. So the question I'll ask you is, if you were given a picture, how do you distinguish whether the picture has a, that of a dog or a cat? Any guesses, any thoughts? So Prisha says body part good, and can you uh, give? Uh, can you talk about yeah the features? So what features would you say are critical for this? What features would you look at to say okay for face good? So now both cats and dogs have faces, right? So what would you look at to determine? Yeah. So yeah, so very good answers. Okay, something happened. All right, can we see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm not sure there's a slight uh, disturbance, but I think we're over now. So, okay. Yeah. So as you guys think, so for example, you look at the noses, they're shaped differently. You look at the ears. We also you look at the viscous, the catchics are typically much bigger and much stronger, right? 
So yeah, so lots of good ways to figure out. So let's just look at the features of the image and decide. And to be frank, and also look at the pause. AI is actually not that different. So AI is fundamentally, they learn the patterns in the images. So, and what you see, and actually a very good example. So one person pointed out that cats have whiskers, but dogs don't. And Akshay responded, my dog does. So what you'll see in all of the image recognition tasks is that they will be, you can never be 100% accurate. And that's true for humans also. If you look at a picture, a lot of pictures, it's easy to see what's the cattle dog, but sometimes you can't make out that easily, right? And that's true for, for AIs also. But the core idea remains that AIs fundamentally learn by looking at it, understanding and learning the patterns. And based on these patterns, they basically, they, in the images, they figure out the different features. Then they figure out the patterns that map the features to the decision of whether somebody is a cat or somebody is a dog. And that's exactly what you're going to do. And so one important thing there is for supervised learning, the classically, there are two different stages. The first is called training, which is where you basically take lots and lots of these example images and you say, ah, look at these uh, 10 images. All these are examples of cats. And then look at a bunch of other images and say, okay, these are examples of dogs. So you feed the AI all these different images and then use it to train what's called a model. And we'll cover the specific model a bit later. And then once this training is complete, then you basically make it available for everybody to use. And then you say, ah, you, let's say you're given a brand new image. You give it to the algorithm to say, given the model, please predict whether this is a cat or a dog. So that's what happens in our case also. Okay. So for hands-on exercise, you need to go to aiclub.org. I'll put the URL on the chat. And um, so the people that signed up before noon today, you would have received the credentials. Otherwise, for the rest of you, you can either wait for the credential or you can try to sign up on the spot. So I put the login on the Zoom chat. Okay, does everybody see the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can click on login. So I'm already logged in, so I'll see this page. If you're not logged in, you'll see something a bit different. You'll see a page you need to enter your login and password, or you can log in using your Google credentials. So please let me know when you are done with this. Once you get to this place, what you can do is that uh, you can click on your avatar and select go to navigator. You'll see a screen that looks like this. You'll only see three of these tiles. You won't see the last three, but leave those aside. You'll at least see these three slides, these three tiles. And on this first tile, click on create an AI service. And you basically had to give it a service name. Let's just call it, sorry. Wait, uh, what button did you click to get there? Sure. So let's go, let me go back and uh, start again. So from here, I clicked on login. From login, I clicked on go to navigator. And go to narrator gives me this screen. You'll see something similar, except you'll see only three tiles, A, B, C. You will not see the last three tiles. Click on the first tile that says create an AI service. That'll take to a page that looks like this. Does that make sense? Amit, is it uh, different logins for different people? Yeah. So the people who signed up by noon today, yes. who put in the survey, they got the log. So I set up, we set up the logins for them. Okay. For everybody else, you can try to sign up on the fly. Sometimes that can be a little bit unpredictable if you don't know how to navigate those screens. So that's why we wanted to make sure we set up this thing for everyone. If you haven't done it, just watch me do this and you'll be able to okay. do this after the class. Okay. 
So I'm being told that we've got two minutes left. So let me just try to build it here quickly. Okay. So here you have to say database images. Select simple storage service. The folder is Air Club datasets. Within it, you have to select catch stock subset. So this is the one which is preloaded with the images of 20 cats and 20 dogs. Okay. Once you see this and it's done, then you can click on feature engineering. And so this is an important key step in a machine learning, uh, in the training of a machine learning model. We will not discuss more details of this right now. A little bit kind of, we're also out of time. But uh, if you have any questions about this, happy to answer you basically after the end of the class in the Slack. Okay. So this is where the featuring steps are complete. You can kind of see it identify the problem type. It's an image classification problem and formatted that there wasn't anything to do and so on. Okay. So very quickly, uh, so just uh, in the interest of time uh, for the, so Rishi, when the next presenter is here, please let me know and uh, we'll switch over. Okay. So there's a request to say, can we finish this next class? That's fine. We can do that. So let's make sure everybody can basically everybody at least got to this stage. And then we'll continue working on this, but as soon as the Lego robotics team is here, I would like us to stop and not take any of their time. That makes sense? Yeah, so Amit, in the next class, by then everyone has a login. So we'll start with this example in the next class. Okay. So the question about can we have sessions on Zoom in addition to in-person, it depends on the specific facility we go to, whether it has the support for that. So we'll be able to update you later on that. All right. So let's go to training for the people that have set up the state this thing here. So let's kick. Okay. So one question here, if we fill out the form afternoon, will the content be available? Yes, the accounts will be made available, but they'll be available within the next 24 hours. So just leave all the things default, just click on training button and that'll start the training process. So let me this again. Happen there. So what happens in training is that the system essentially pulls the information from every single image one by one. And then it does it, uses it to adjust what are called weights inside the machinery. And these weights determine depending on particular, okay. So let me walk back a little bit. There's a question about what did we do on the data set tab? So I, I'll show you that. If you guys are already at this stage, please keep running it. And uh, Lego Robotics team, please, please, please speak up if you're here. I want to stop as soon as you get here. I don't want to take your time. Okay, so let's get a different data service here. Let's say that's dogs. <coughs> So on the data sets tab, we first selected images, then we selected simple storage service, then we selected AI from data sets, and then we set for the image folder, pick the cat stock subset. And this basically loads up the subset, and that's it. So that's what we need to do on the data sets tab. Okay, let's go back here. So mm -hmm. training is progressing. Training typically takes about five minutes. And uh, so while we wait for the thing to happen, are there any questions? Yes, Amit, a great session. And we have Anu here who's going to run the next one. Okay, perfect. So I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Anu, please start sharing and I will get out. Thank you, I'll Amit. Make you Thank you, Manoj. Uh, an excellent session. Got things going for us. Uh, really appreciate it. Okay. Anu, uh, the stage is yours, uh, Anu and team. Okay, and, uh, wonderful. Yeah, go ahead, Manoj. No, no, I was saying thank you, Rishi, for organizing. Very easy to follow with good, good examples. Yeah. And okay, I've been Anu. doing the exercises as well. So I'll probably be bugging both Manoj and Amit uh, 
as I also come up to speed. So thank yes. you. Okay. My pleasure. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're still having a few people log on, so we'll get started in like two minutes. So at this point, uh, if you are interested in the Lego robotics, please stay. If you are curious, please stay. If you have other more exciting things to do on this hot, hot afternoon, please log off and, uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. So quick uh, perspective on Lego Robotics. We started this in 2012. Uh, this was one of our earliest offerings. And uh, back in the like 2009, 2010 timeframe, we used to have a single Lego Robotics team from Saratoga and in the neighborhood, neighboring, neighboring areas, not too many teams. And then we started this something called Team Formation Day. And uh, we would typically form about 25, 30 teams on Team Formation Day. And it led to some very effective collaboration between our young students, uh, I believe from fourth graders to eighth graders. Uh, and they would go and run competitions and uh, our teams have done extremely well. We would run scrimmages at the community center uh, to get our teams prepared. And sometimes I would be the, uh, the referee on that, tabulating points. We had two tables. So it was uh, very nicely done. Uh, many of our parents would volunteer for that one. And uh, since the pandemic broke out, it sort of fell apart. But also, I think our middle school, Redwood Middle School, has uh, a Lego robotics program. And so our students uh, feel a little less of a need to join this particular summer program. Though we do have lots of students who come from, from uh, school districts that do not have a funded Lego robotics program. So that's a quick uh, background of where we are. And we have been running this for, I would say almost 10 years now. And uh, we had uh, somebody who just went to college. And so Anu, Anu has taken charge and Anu and team, Anu and friends. So with that, I'll turn it over to Anu to get things going. Uh, hi, so um, yeah, so I'm Anu, I'm... Um, one of the leads for this uh, Lego Robotics Bootcamp. Um, and we'll just start with, oh, so this today, um, we're going to go over the, our introduction to FLL um, and an overview of like how the, t how the competition works. And uh, towards the end, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how you can register your team. So we'll start with some introductions. So I'm Anu, um, I participated in FLL uh, for two years and um, I made it to the regional level. Um, my team won the Judges and Core Values Awards and currently I'm in Saratoga High School's FRC team uh, where we just made it to the Worlds Division at, or the Division Finalist level at Worlds. Okay, um, I'm Deeksha. I also participated in the FLL regionals and my team won the project and robot game award. Um, and then like Anu, I'm also part of the FRC program at Saratoga High. And yeah, we also went to Worlds. Hi, I'm Audit. Uh, I have started robotics since ninth grade and I'm I was currently the software lead of 7390 FTC MSET Jellyfish. Hi, I'm Ashika. Um, I'm a two-time FTC regionals participant, and I was the hardware lead of um, 7641 FTC Betafish. And um, Adit and Ashika will be, so Deeksha and I are both uh, going into our senior year this year. So after we leave, then Adit and Ashika are going to take over for us for this program. So this is our schedule for the boot camp. Uh, we're gonna have four sessions. Um, this week, we're again going to go over like an overview of FLL. Uh, next week, we're gonna talk about robot strategy and design. The week after that, we're gonna go over the basics of software in FLL. And then our final week will be um, going over project and judging categories that you'll face in competitions. 
so he, we're just going to show like a really quick um, video to give you an idea of how FLL works. So. The audio seems to be missing. Oh, OK. There is a setting on Zoom where you can pipe the computer audio. Oh, um, let me see where that is. Rishi, do you know where the setting is? Does she have to be a host? Uh, yeah, I can't seem to find it. Yeah, I think you have to sign on as host. So it oh, looks, okay. looks like Rishi has left. So today you can just play without the audio. Well, okay. So let's. Okay, so then we're not going to show the video this time. Okay. Okay, so Diksha, do you want to go ahead? Okay, so here are just um, some of the first competitions. So the first one is Junior FLL, and this is for ages six through eight, and this uses Lego elements. And then FLL, which is First Lego League, is for ages nine through 14, and this uses Lego Mindstorms. And then FTC, which is First Tech Challenge, and this uses um, Tetrix and Matrix kits. And then FRC is first robotics competition for grades nine through 12. And this is typically custom parts and the robot is about 120 pounds. So um, in FLL, there's a lot of components um, and it's kind of like engineering, problem solving, teamwork, and also gracious professionalism to solve these real world problems. And so teams, um, at the competition, teams will present solutions to um, will present solutions using Lego robots, and these competitions can occur at regional, state, national, and international levels. So for FLL, um, the age bracket for the competition is ages nine through fourteen, or uh, like grades four through eight, um, and. Your team can have up to 10 members, but it's usually recommended that you have about five to six per team, just so that there's like a fair delegation of tasks to complete. And this is a general calendar or schedule of uh, how the season will uh, go about. So in August, uh, the challenge will be released um, where you'll see like what types of projects you can create for the competition and what types of missions your robot will need to complete. Um, from October to, or from November to December, you'll have your qualifying matches. And then um, if you go on to compete at the regional level, then February will be regionals. And in April, there will be the um, world championships. So the competing season will basically be from November to June. Okay, so the FLL um, first releases the challenge, and this is going to be based around a real world scientific topic. And then um, within the challenge itself, there are three parts, which is the robot game, the project, and then core values. So the, for, the, for the robot game, um, you're essentially going to program an autonomous robot to score points, and this will be on like a themed playing field. Um, and then for the project, you 
um, develop a solution to the project, which you're then going to present to the judges. And then um, there is kind of a guided exercise with the team to show their core values. And in the past, these challenges have been based on climate change, the quality of life for a handicapped population and transportation. And again, the challenges will be kind of designed around the real world. Um, yeah, so in 2018, it was hydrodynamics in 2019 into orbit. And then 2020 was city shapers. 2021 was replay, 2022 was cargo connect, and then 2023 is the super powered. Uh, so the videos can't play, but uh, we'll send the slideshow in the chat after we're done. Um, so this was gonna be an example of a robot that completed basically all of the challenges. Um, this isn't like, you don't need to um, mirror your robot after like a specific video, but you can obviously take like inspiration from videos you might see on the internet or YouTube. Um, but again, yeah, you can like look at this video after we share the link. Uh, so FLL competitions have four main parts. The first part is the robot game where your robot will just complete the missions that you're given um, at the competitions. Um, the second component is the robot design, uh, which is a judged category. And basically what where it says like in parentheses, the judged, uh, that means you're gonna go into a room with, your team will go into a room where there will be like a panel of two or three uh, judges and you'll explain like what you're being judged on. So for robot design, you'd show them your robot and why you might've designed your robot in a specific way. Um, the third component is the project which um, Deeksha had explained before, like it'll be based on a real life uh, problem and your team will have to explain um, in a creative manner, like what problem they're deciding to solve. And then the fourth um, category is core values, which is just where your team will show how they've collaborated and how they've acted as a team based on the FLL core values. And uh, the core values will go into a little bit later into the slideshow. So the robot game will be played on a four by eight inch field or feet field and um, all the teams will have identical field kits and you can um, learn more about that in the challenge documents. And then the game consists of multiple missions. So um, each or the team will have to program to attempt these missions and then each mission will be worth um, different points. And the teams will design, build, and program the robot to solve the missions. And I, um, and each robot game will be around two minutes and thirty seconds. Um, so the judging categories um, we had talked about before are robot design, project, and core values. Um, so the team will meet with a separate judge of panels for each category. And each judging session is about 10 minutes where half of the time is allotted for the team to present on the category. And the other half will be for the judges to ask any clarifying questions. And um, while you present or while the judges find the answers to their questions, um, they're gonna fill out a rubric, which you can find online. Um, and after the competition, I believe the, the um, First, we'll send you like your where you scored on each rubric um, so that like if you're going to regionals, then you can find like places that you can adjust your presentation or like how you answer questions. Um, so this is like an example of a robot design. Um, so for the judging, um, for the judging session, um, the judges will ask you about like what your robot can do and how it's like unique maybe from other robots that are competing at the competition. So below that's just like a little graphic of one of like a robot that has competed in the past. Um, and then it's just like showing like 
what each component does and why it's important to solving any of the missions that are on the board. Um, and you just basically during your presentation, um, if you find that there's a specific component on your robot that you really want to exemplify to the judges, then you would just present that to the judge and show like that your robot can has this capability and what it's used for. And then for a project, you're going to choose a topic that is related to kind of the theme of the whole game. And then you research the topic. And as a team, you create an innovative solution. And then um, typically, we would recommend that you go out and you kind of share that solution with others and get some feedback to see how you can improve. And then at the competition, you would present your research and your solution to the judges. And then these are example projects. Yeah, so yeah, these uh, will be linked in the slide show. Um, so these are the core values, which we talked about a little bit previously. Um, like this, the core values kind of go throughout all of the first competitions, where whether you're an FLL, FTC, FRC. Um, so, the main, so the core values are discovery, innovation, impact, teamwork, and inclusion. Uh, and fun. So you, in your core values judging session, um, the judges will test your team to see how, like to ask you like examples of how you might've shown each of these core values while building your robot or like just during the entire season um, leading up to the competition. Um, another term that is really common in first, which is in a core value is gracious professionalism and cooperation. Um, these two values are really important to first um, and in the judging category or in the judging session for core values, you'll very much want to exemplify it. Um, Cooperation is kind of like cooperating with other teams that you're competing with. It's just like their slogan, I guess. Um, and gracious professionalism is showing um, like exemplifying these core values throughout your team and to other teams as well. Um, so also in the judging session for core values, um, in order to see how your team works together, the judges will give the team like a short activity to perform to demonstrate how um, your team generally works together when they're building the robot or coding. Um, and then they'll also ask you like specific questions on how you've used core values, um, not only in the activity that you performed in front of them, but also during the season. Um, so the core values would include like how you interacted with other teams or professionals and your community. Um, and basically the entire idea of the core values judging session is just to see that you're treating your team with respect, but also treating your community and your fellow com competitors with respect as well. So top of um, so the top teams advance to the regional championship. So the team has to be ranked in the top forty percent for robot game, and then they have to be ranked really highly in all the other categories. So, for example, if you just do really well in the robot game, but your team is lacking core values, then it's unlikely that you um, that the team will advance. So it's really important that the team is kind of strong in all the aspects. And then the number of teams advancing will depend on the size of the qualifier, the number of qualifiers, and the overall size of the championship. And just um, and although and winning the award doesn't guarantee an advancement. So this is the link that you can register your team with, and then this will help you make a first account, which then you can follow the additional steps to register your team. Uh, so these are just a few screen grabs of what you should see when you're registering your team. Um, and you can look through the slideshow when you're registering your team, just to make sure that you're on the right track. Um, and then this is really important. So after you register your team, you will want to register for like notifications about the um, FLL competitions near you um, so that you know which competitions are coming up and which ones you can sign up for. 
So the cost um, will never be per student, but instead as a whole team. And the new team's registration fee is typically around $900. And this will include registration, the robot kit, and the field setup kit. And then um, if you have, um, then there will be additional costs for the event participation, travel, food, team t-shirts, and other optional items. So the challenge mat will basically be like the robot game mat where all the missions are located. And this will be available through the first dashboard. And um, like I said, it'll include the mat, the Legos for the mission models, and each model will be divided into bags with instructions on how to build them. Uh, so at the beginning of the season, after you've created your team, um, it's important for the team to have a goal for what they want to complete during the season. Um, if you sign up for a qualifier, don't like, don't back out of it just because you think the team isn't ready for the uh, qualifier. Um, just go and see what happens, I guess. Um, and sometimes there are local scrimmages that are happening with other teams that are in your area. Um, there was like a local elementary school uh, that was holding a scrimmage for all uh, FLL teams that were near them. Um, this was last season. So if you hear about these types of opportunities, then I would definitely recommend uh, going to them. Um, and before starting the season, don't feel like you need to have everything, like be an expert on everything. Um, because the point of like the entire season is to make sure that you're continuously learning um and so for like so each team will have a couple of coaches maybe like one or two um so it's good for them to make sure that like the team is learning and working together to learn new things but then also being involved if there are any like incredibly difficult tasks that they can't find and so for coaches there are typically two um but the coaches aren't supposed to be doing like everything for the team. Uh, the main idea is again, for the kids to be learning. Um, so the coaches should mainly make sure that the team is like on task uh, to, and on, on track to being um, ready for the competition that they're gonna compete at. Um, so yeah, so coaches should just basically be guiding them and teaching them new skills, handling any logistics that come with like competing at the team. Um, asking questions to lead the team and then um, making sure that the team is like following rules. And then the team members, which are the students, um, they should be doing the majority of the work. So like deciding strategies, um, building programs, researching, choosing problems, and then again, presenting to the judges. And some retiring groups um, in this case, the Tiger Bots have extra tables, so you can try to join their email list with the link above to see if they have any you can borrow. Um, but if you're also building your own table, then here's the link for instructions and dimensions on how to build that. And it's, this is um, like the PDF version of a book for some of the winning designs that teams have used in the past. Uh, and then this is just like a slide of good resources. Um, yeah, the presentation will be available to you. Um, so yeah, so if you just need any help, then all of, all of your questions should be answered through one of these resources. Uh, and then this is the end of our session this week. Um, so if you have any questions, we'll be staying a couple minutes later but um if you have any questions after we leave then uh we can i can put my email in the chat and then you can let me know so uh, i'll add i'm gonna stop sharing i'll add the slideshow to the to the chat box uh so that you guys can view it Are there any questions for the presenters at this point? Um, so for the list of teams, um, if you 
you can always like reach out to um, friends um, that you think might be interested in participating. Um, I'm not sure if there's like an entire like Facebook group or like Google groups group that is like a public forum where like anyone can ask um, about like adding team members. But um, I would always start with just asking people that you know if like their children would be interested in participating. Um, for mentors, it's I would always recommend just um, asking previous participants of FLL, like a lot of high school uh, robotics members, they were most likely participants of FLL. Um, so you can always reach out to any of them and ask if they would be able to um, mentor the team. Um, but you can also ask like, like if any of the parents of the students in the team, um, if they're in any way familiar with any type of uh, robotics or like engineering, uh, I think they could also serve as a mentor. Also, just to add on for how you can find a team, um, a lot of the elementary schools, I think, especially Argonaut has FLL teams. So, um, you know, if you can't really find a group of friends who are interested, you could also check with some of the elementary schools. And then, um, I'll put both mine and Deeksha's emails in the chat um, so that you guys can email any of either of us if you have any questions. I think for mentorship, uh, they can also reach out to one of you guys, you know, other than Ashika, uh, Deeksha and Anu. If, um, if you have the cycles, you might be able to consider that as well, right? Yeah. So like in the past, we have um, met with teams to discuss any questions that they have um, regarding like robot building or like anything that they might be unfamiliar with because they're new teams. Um, so if you are in need of like a similar type of mentorship, then um, any of us four are available. Uh, we'll stay on for like five more minutes uh, in case there are any other questions. You can put them in the chat or just unmute. Adit and Ashika, would you like to share your email addresses as well so that um, in case any of the participants wants to reach out to you for mentorship, perhaps? Sure. Yeah. That'll be great. Thank you. So to add on to what um, Anu and, uh, and uh, Diksha just mentioned about uh, finding a team, uh, some of the things um, have worked in the past as well as that people have, you know, students have reached out to their own school district, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, through a parents group, sent messages to their own, uh, you know, peers or people, you know, students who are like one grade ahead or one grade uh, lower and to form teams. So there have been, often we found like people have been able to form a team with like fourth, fifth, sixth graders. Um, you know, also we found like with when Anu started FLL, uh, she, she started in seventh grade and there were, there were students from her school, uh, not necessarily in her immediate friend circle, but they were a part of this FLL robotics uh, group. Uh, they attended and then the teams were formed. So there are various ways you can actually reach out to actually form a team of your own and take it forward.
So Anu, you want to announce the next session is going to be same time at four o'clock, right? Uh, at, at three at o'clock. Um, at three o'clock. Yeah, so for the next uh, three weeks, we'll have the same um, three to about, um, we have the time slot from three to four, um, but yeah, but it'll just be uh, at the same link. Okay. Good job, um, guys. Uh, I think I'm going to, I'll end the um, meeting, and then if anyone needed any questions answered, then you can email any of us. Okay, thank you.